everybody. Welcome to my book club. Now, this is the very first video I'm doing. To be honest, I'm a little bit nervous. I've never done a book club before. But recently, the company Audible has sponsored my podcasts. So I'm very pleased. I'm very happy. Uh, a big corporate sponsor. And I've had some other sponsors. Uh, Grammarly is a, another company. And I'll talk about them in the future too. But I like Audible. It's an Amazon company. I like them because it's audio books. So, you know, we all have books and some of you like to read books. But I'm not a reading teacher, vocabulary, grammar, that's not my focus. I'm a little bit on the higher level and I prefer listening classes and listening comprehension. So Audible, audiobooks and me are a great combination. So it's a perfect opportunity uh, for me to start this book club. We've been discussing a book club for several months, uh, the DDM members and myself, and uh, I think this is going to be lots of fun. So our first book is, and uh, this address, you can actually get the book for free uh, if you sign up. Um, I warn you, uh, if you sign up, the first book is free, but then after one month, they will charge your credit card $14.95. Now, every month you can choose another book. So you're, you're paying $15 for a book. The first book is free and then you have to pay every month. So what my plan is, is every month have a different audio book. So if you stay with Audible, you'll be able to follow uh, in the book club. If you do not join Audible, that's fine. Uh, if you still have the book in print, uh, you can still join the book club. Even if you don't have the book club, you can watch the videos. But if a lot of people join, uh, then absolutely I will continue doing the book club. But if people stop joining, then I might stop the book club. It, it, this is taking a lot of time and I'm nervous. I don't know how to do this. So the first book is this. Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Album, and specifically the 10th Anniversary Edition. Now this is a fantastic book. It's really a wonderful book. Um, it's, we're going to talk about it in a second. It's 3 hours and 41 minutes, so not too long. And today, in this first video, I'm going to talk about the first hour. It's actually one hour and four minutes, one hour and five minutes. And then a little bit later, I'll make another video for this, the second section and then another video for the last section. So uh, let's begin. Now we start with the introduction. And uh, the situation is there's a guy named Mitch. Mitch is the author. He's 40 years old. He's 38 years old. He's an author. And there's Maury. Maury is a college professor. When Mitch was in college, Maury was his professor. And they had a great, beautiful relationship. Really wonderful relationship. And then Mitch graduated from college, and he started his life, and he forgot about Maury and the great relationship. But then one day, Mitch learned that Maury was very sick and he was going to die. And Mitch decided, I have to go say hi. Actually, I have to go say goodbye. He was such an important person. So when Mitch was in college and he would talk to his professor, he didn't call his professor professor, he called his professor coach. I really like that because I call myself coach. Uh, so let's start with the introduction. When they first meet after 16 years, so he graduated college, 
He started working, and 16 years later, he learns oh, Maury is sick, and he meets Maury. When they first meet, Maury asks Mitch, How come you didn't call me coach? Why didn't you call me coach? Remember, Maury's a professor. Everybody calls him professor. Only Mitch called him coach, and he, he really liked that. And immediately, Mitch was touched. Oh, yeah, yeah. I need to call you coach. That's right, that's right. So there's that, for me as a coach, I just like that bond. So my question is, what does coach mean to Mitch? What does coach mean to Maury? Well, to Mitch, coach is the person who he respects, who he knows, is very talented, and who will help him find his best effort. That's Mitch's definition. Maury, why does Maury like coach? Because Maury gets to direct Mitch, and he gets to live through Mitch. Mitch is his player, and he's the coach, so Mitch is playing the game of life, and Maury can direct it. He likes that. We learned that Maury has ALS. And we studied about ALS. It's also called Lou Gehrig's disease. In DDM, we studied about Lou Gehrig's disease. Lou Gehrig's disease is a scary disease. It's a nerve disease. It affects the nerves in your body. And this is how they describe it. Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, is like a lit candle, a candle with a flame, and it melts your nerves. So the candle is made of wax, and the wax melts. Well, the nerves in your body, they melt, leaving your body a pile of wax. So eventually your nerves melt, and if your nerves melt, if your nerves lose their power, what happens? You cannot move. You look like a human, but you can't move. And that's, so it's like a candle and the wax melting and it's just a blob of wax. The, the body is just a blob of skin and bone. There's no life inside. That's what Lou Gehrig's disease does. It's very sad. Lou Gehrig's disease takes about five years before you die. And usually the last part of your body that, that, that moves are your lungs. Your lungs fail and you cannot breathe and you die. So it's a very sad disease. It's very kind of slow. Five years is actually kind of fast, but you lose your legs and then you lose your ability to stand and then you lose your arms and then you lose your head, and then it's just your eyes and your mouth. Eventually, you can't really move your mouth, and then finally your lungs. It's a very sad disease. They talk about life after death, and Maury was agnostic, which means he doesn't believe in God. He, he, maybe there's a God, but he's not sure. Atheist is somebody who believes in no God. Uh, you, when you're dead, you're dead. Agnostic, you're not sure. You're not sure. But as Maury got the disease and has, as he becomes weaker and weaker, he realizes ah, there, there is something. There is something. Okay? Maybe it is God. And he says this. The universe is too grand and harmonious to be an accident. The universe is, is too grand, too amazing, and too harmonious. Things work together so beautifully in the, mo in, in the universe, it cannot be an accident. There must be something or someone who created the universe. It's too perfect. It's too beautiful. 
It's pretty nice. I'm curious. Uh, I know some of you might be atheists. What do you think? And, and you can't answer because Murray, Maury, I'm sorry, Maury is, is dying. He's got months to live. And I think your philosophy on life might change in those situations. I don't know. They talk about reincarnation. Now, I don't think Maury actually believes in reincarnation. Reincarnation means you die and then you come back as something else. Uh, Maury says he wants to come back as uh, an animal. Uh, but reincarnation, I think Buddhists believe in reincarnation. Me, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I believe in reincarnation. But if you could be reincarnated, what would you like to come back as? Me? I don't know. Maybe a tree. I think a tree would be pretty cool. A tree that lives a long time. A really, really long living tree. Yeah, that, that, that might be the best, best way to come back. Then I, I'll create no problems, I hope. They talk about, uh, he talks about Mitch whenever he sees Maury. Maury, his body is very weak, but he gets a twinkle, a sparkle in his eye. And he knows, Mitch knows that, wow, Maury is truly happy to see me. He really loves seeing me. And I thought this was nice because a twinkle in your eye when we use that expression, we usually imagine children. Because children have that real honest happiness. They're, they don't expect anything, they're just happy. When they see a puppy or a flower or mommy or daddy, they, they're really happy and you get that sparkle. And if, if think about it. Do you feel that sparkle? When was the last time you felt that sparkle when, when you see somebody or something and you just feel, wow, it's so beautiful? Yeah, I think uh, many of us probably don't feel that sparkle so much. Maybe we should start looking for things that make us happy. Maybe, maybe we can be that sparkle in somebody else's eye. Maybe we can be the Mitch to another Maury. Uh, I know when I came back to the United States uh, and saw my mom and dad, yeah, definitely there was a sparkle in their eyes and uh, I'm so glad uh, that I came back. I was gone for a long time. Not running away, but just busy, work. And then I finally had the chance to come back and it was nice, it's nice to be the sparkle uh, in my parents' eye. Very nice. Am I the sparkle in anybody's eye? I hope so. Um, they talk about being fully present, to be present in a situation. And once again, in DDM, we had a lesson about this, being present in a situation. And the simple example is, when you eat an orange, an orange, uh, maybe all of you eat oranges, but do you actually enjoy the process? Do you pick up the orange? Do you feel it? Do you feel its coolness, the, the skin of the orange, its roughness? You smell it. You can smell the orange. It's very relaxing and at the same time kind of exciting, the smell. And, and it, you stick your thumb in and, and you start to peel it and you can actually see the juice spraying and the smell is very strong and you taste it and you chew on it. Many people chew too fast but you chew slowly and you can feel the individual sacks of juice. You feel it go down and feel it cool and refreshing and satisfying. That is being present. So when you eat, are you present? When you drink coffee, are you present? When you talk with somebody, are you present? 
When you're talking with somebody, are you looking at them? Are you looking at their expressions? Are you feeling their emotion? Are you imagining their situation? Are you present? Or are you looking at your cell phone, thinking about what's going to happen tonight, wondering when you can leave? Being present is such a valuable thing. And Mitch is saying when he's with Maury, he knows that Maury is present. And he feels bad because he's thinking, oh my God, I need to be present. Being present allows you to enjoy life and to feel happiness. A lot of happiness if you're present. It's really nice. He talked about hugging Maury, giving Maury a hug. And as an adult, you know, as a child, with a child we hug our kids a lot, I hope. Um, but as an adult, some people hug, but most of us don't that much. Um, especially your dad or your mom, hopefully your husband or your wife. Um, but we, we don't hug much. And some of us, we, we feel nervous when we hug, you know. Arr, arr. <laughs> we, I don't know why, but we, we build a wall, this emotional wall, and, and if you hug somebody, and if you hug them really, if you close your eyes and you hug them really tight, you can feel that wall break. And you feel the warmth and you feel the love. And when Mitch would hug Maury, slowly but surely he could feel that wall breaking. Maury was, was going to die. Months to live. But Maury was happier, more loving than Mitch. Mitch has got a long, healthy, happy life ahead of him, but Maury was the happy one. Maury was the open one. And he was feeling this warmth, this love through a hug. When's the last time we've hugged? Yeah, even for me, when I, when I came back from Korea, I, of course, I hugged my mom and dad that day. And since then, I don't think I've hugged them. So, uh, yeah, the next time I see mom, I'll have to hug her. Dad? I don't know. I should try, though. I should try. Um, my question for you, why did Maury write the book? Uh, he actually wrote the book so that they could bring in some money to help pay for Maury's uh, medical bills. So Mitch wrote the book, and, the, and the, the first reason he wrote the book was so that he could help pay for Maury's medical bills. It's very expensive, so that's, that's why he wrote the book. Now, as it turns out, the book is one of the world's best sellers. Uh, it made Mitch Album a lot of money, and uh, he's pretty lucky. But he did not write the book to make money. He actually wrote the book to help his professor, his coach, uh, pay for his bills. This is all in the introduction. The last big part of the introduction was Maury's death wish. Mm, and some people think about a death wish. What do they hope? What do they wish for when they die? Maury's death wish was that his consciousness go on so that he is part of the universe. So when he dies, he hopes. He knows that his physical body is dead, but his consciousness, his mind, the energy in the mind, because his mind is very awake. It's just his body that's dead right now. But when he dies, he hopes that his mind, his consciousness, will go on, will continue, and be a part of the universe, the amazing universe. Yeah, that's a pretty good death wish. I like that. 
So we get into the actual story. And uh, Maury. Maury was a professor. He enjoyed life. He was a nice guy. And he was active. He liked dancing and swimming and walking and, and eating. He, he enjoyed life. He's married, very happy with his wife. But his death sentence came the day he gave up dancing. So he knew that he was sick. He knew that there were some problems with him. And one day, he could no longer dance. He loved to dance. He would go to a local church, uh, mostly young kids there, every night or once a week or something, and they would play music. And whatever the music, he would go there and dance with a towel around his neck, like exercise. And it was at night. And he had no partners. He was dancing for himself, feeling the music, feeling the energy, and getting his exercise. But one day, because of the disease, he, he couldn't dance anymore. And he felt, this is my death sentence. Now I know I'm going to die. It's a very sad day for Maury. His first reaction when he realized he was going to die, his first reaction was he heard it from the doctor and he left the hospital and he realized the world is moving. You know, that mom is going to the store, these children are playing and laughing, cars are going by, but I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die, but the world doesn't care. Everything is going. It's very shocking, very numbing experience for him. What do I do now? What do I do? You have two choices. You can go home and feel sorry, or you can continue living. Well, Maury decided that he would keep going. He kept driving until one day he couldn't drive anymore. He kept swimming until one day he couldn't swim anymore. He kept teaching at the university, but one day he couldn't teach anymore. So then, when he couldn't move around freely, he offered himself as a human textbook. I will teach the world my life, my experience. And this is what he said. He would mori would walk that final bridge between life and death and narrate the trip. So right now, Maury, this is life, life is living, it's wonderful, this is death. Okay? And most of us, we're just here, we're living life, and then one day, boom, we're dead. Heart attack, you know, something, car accident, something, okay? Living, 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 dead. But Maury, he has a disease. He knows he's got months to live. So right now, Maury's right here. He's on this bridge between life and death. And he's going to narrate. He's going to describe. He's going to tell this story of what this is like. And this is the book, Tuesdays with Maury, is the narration of this. And it's a beautiful story. Um, he wanted to prove that dying was not synonymous with useless. Many people, when they, if they hear that they're dying, they have a month, two months, a year to live, they feel useless. Many people do. And Maury was determined, no, no, this last year, you are not useless and I'm going to prove it. And that's the book. Before he died, Maury had a living funeral. So a funeral is the ceremony. So somebody dies and then the family comes and we have a funeral. And at the funeral we say, oh, he was a good man. He was very nice and generous. And we say all these nice things. 
and Maury went to a funeral. One of the college professors died of a heart attack, and he went to the funeral, and he said, oh, this is terrible. So he decided to have a living funeral. And he invited all his friends and family, and they had a funeral for Maury. And everybody said what they thought about Maury. But more importantly, Maury had the chance to tell them what he thought about them. So, the funeral's done. Everybody's happy. And everybody will have even better memories of Maury. So what happened to Mitch? He was in college, great friends with Maury. Then what happened to Mitch? Mitch became a member of society. He wanted to be a musician. So for years he tried to be a musician. He was a good piano player. But it just wasn't working for him. He had an uncle who got cancer. And his uncle, he loved his uncle, and he watched his uncle die. And he knew his uncle was a corporate man who didn't like his job, and, and now at a young age, he was dead, his children were still in school, his wife was still young. Mitch decided, no, this is, this is not the way to live. I need to be more active, I need to be more aggressive, I need to be more successful, more powerful. I have to find achievement. I have to accomplish things. So Mitch said, playing music is a game, it's too much fun, it's pointless. No, that's wrong. So he went to night school, he got his master's degree in journalism, and he became a sports writer. And he was good. He worked nonstop. He became a very famous sports writer. He did television shows. He wrote books. He was accomplishing so many things, and this gave him meaning to his life. He was in fifth gear. His life was in fifth gear. So what he's talking about is like in a sports car. If you're driving a car, first gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, and the fastest, fifth gear. Fast. And that's what Mitch's life was. Fast. He was moving. He was doing things. Busy. Television, radio, newspapers, books, magazines, interviews, everything. Non-stop, busy, busy. Always on his cell phone, making money, buying houses, buying cars, nice suits, good dinners, travel, meeting sports stars. He was a success. Rah! Fifth gear, baby. But he lost touch with Maury completely. And he lost touch with almost everyone. He did have a, a girlfriend, and she was very patient with him. Even though he's super busy, she stayed with him. She knew he was a good guy. He was just in fifth gear, but she stayed with him. So, after college, Mitch lost his inner connections, his friendships, his loves, his passions. And everything changed to accomplishment, to building, to getting, to gaining, to creating. That's typical for many of us, especially lots of dads, but I know lots of moms too. One night, uh, Mitch was at home and he's flipping through channels on the television and he sees a famous American news show called Nightline and the news anchor is a man named Ted Koppel. And somehow, Ted Koppel's story was about his old professor, Maury. And the story was, who is Maury, and why will you care about him? 
Ted Koppel, this is true on television, was doing a story about this professor who was dying and sharing his narration of the bridge between life and death. And Mitch, by chance, saw this. And he was shocked. And he realized, oh my God, 16 years. I haven't seen this man that was like a father to me, so special to me. And he was embarrassed. And he wanted to go say hi, actually goodbye, but he's embarrassed because he's, he's changed, but he did. So the next section was called the orientation. Oh no, there's a little bit more here, sorry. During this time, Maury was thinking about life and his philosophies on life and how to live, learn to forgive, learn to love. He's, he's making these notes about life. This, he's talking about the bridge. This is how you can die comfortably if you learn how to forgive people. If you learn how to love people, then you can go to death comfortably. Maury would ask people questions when they came to him. And some of his questions were, tell me something close to your heart. Tell me something about faith, what you believe in. Maury liked to learn from other people what they felt was close, what their faith was. He didn't care if you were Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist or Hindu, atheist, agnostic. He didn't care. He just wanted to know. He wanted to, to hear other opinions, to learn. And he accepted. He wanted to know what was important to you. Was it your children, your wife, your work, your job, your career, your future, your family, your free time, your vacation, your retirement? What was important? He wanted to know. He wanted to hear what other people felt in life. This was very fulfilling for him, listening to other people. His opinions didn't matter, but listening to other people mattered. He admitted, you know, it sounds like Maury is so happy all the time. Oh, he's always happy. No, no, no. Many times, Maury cried. He's sad. He's got a wife. He's going to be leaving his wife, his children. He cried. Sometimes he was bitter. He was angry. Why me? Why do I have... My mind is alive and I can't move my body. Why me? Why? And he accepted those feelings. He let himself cry. He let himself be angry. And when it was done, he said, oh, Okay. I'm done. Now, let's go back to living. Let's go back to thinking about life and teaching other people about life. So this is important because many people, when they have these strong emotions, they run away and change. They don't let the emotion finish. And emotions do finish. Sometimes they come back every day. Let those emotions come, accept them, acknowledge them, and then be done with them. Okay. And then move on. And go back to loving. Go back to loving. Okay? Yeah, of course you're angry. Of course you're, you, you, you're sad. Of course. Life is not easy. Accept it. And then... All right, let's go again. Every day, Maury experienced that. The next section, once again, is called The Orientation. Mitch, in fifth gear, finally meets Maury. Sixteen years later, he drives up to Maury's house. He's on the phone with a television producer talking about his story, and he sees 
Maury outside. Mitch is like, oh, her, her, her. he's very embarrassed. He's got coffee. He's spilling coffee. He's in fifth gear. Very busy. Accomplishment, accomplishment. And he sees Maury sitting in a wheelchair waiting for Mitch. He, uh, he felt, re Mitch felt really bad, very embarrassed. How would you feel? Can you imagine not seeing somebody for 16 years and then hearing they're going to die and then going to meet them? That would be hard. And we all, all of us, have somebody like that in our life. Right now, we do. Think about it, and there's probably somebody you haven't seen for a very long time who's probably going to die soon. You would be nervous. Maury wasn't nervous. Maury was excited. But Mitch felt nervous. He felt bad. He felt bad. Mitch knew that Maury had this image of this good kid. Oh, Mitch is a good kid. But Mitch knew that he wasn't the same good kid. He had changed. He was worried that Maury would be disappointed. So they meet. And Maury's busy. He's, he's, lots of phone calls coming in, people coming over, lots of friends talking to him. And, and Mitch was like, wow, you know, you're almost dead and you are so busy with all these nice people. And Mitch was thinking, where are the nice people in my life? Well, obviously he had his girlfriend, but Maury was surrounded by nice people. Genuinely nice people. They didn't want anything. They were just nice. And Mitch didn't have any of that. Mitch had become too wrapped up in the siren song of life. And this is another expression that we learned in DDM. The siren song. The sirens goes back to Greek mythology. And there were these... These beautiful but evil women who would call out to sailors Ooh, in a beautiful song and the sailors would go to meet the sirens and the sailors would die. And that's what life is. Life has a siren song. Money attracts us. Fame attracts us. So we, we, in many people in life, we chase money and fame and the siren song. And, and what does it give us? It doesn't give us anything. It, it gives us a temporary happiness, but then we die and we're empty. And that's what Mitch was doing. He was trapped. He was wrapped up in this siren song of life. He was busy. Busy all the time. Fifth gear. He never had long discussions about the meaning of life. A slow, relaxed conversation. His days were full. He was, he was super busy. But there wasn't any satisfaction, always waiting for tomorrow. If you're really happy and you're really satisfied, do you think about tomorrow? No, you, you enjoy what happened. You enjoy now. But people who are too wrapped up in the siren song of life, we think about tomorrow, what we have to do tomorrow, how do we keep it going, how do we keep growing, how do we get better, how do we get more, how do we get richer, how do we get more famous, how do we become more successful. That's that trap. Mitch had that trap. Maury, so relaxed. Maybe that's what death brings. Relaxation. Maybe not. More questions. These are questions that Maury liked to ask. Have you found someone to share your heart with? Meaning a wife, a husband. Are you giving to your community? Do you help your neighbors? 
Are you at peace with yourself? Are you happy with who you are? Do you have regrets? Or are you okay? Are you at peace with yourself? How you are, how you treat others, your relationships? Are you trying to be as human as you can be? Are you trying to be... Because we're all humans. But many of us humans think we're better than other humans. Or try to be better than other humans. But we're all humans. We're all skin and bone and we're all going to die. So maybe, yeah, trying to be successful and, and famous, that could be fine. But remember that we're all human. Are you trying to be as human as you can be. These are questions that Maury would ask. And he asked them to Mitch. Mitch, he's too busy to think about these things. The answer to all of them, yes, but no. He had a girlfriend, but the relationship was seven years. He's old. Get married, not get married, not ready. So that heart connection's not there. Are you giving to the community? I write sports stories, so the community likes it. Is that important? So basically the answer was no to all the questions. Mitch, who's thinking, oh my God, I'm such a bad guy, I'm such a bad guy. He's watching Maury, and Maury's trying to eat. His muscles aren't moving correctly. He can't stand, he can't sit, he can't move his head properly. His breathing is harsh. And yet, Mitch was feeling bad, and Maury was happy. Maury says something very important. The culture we have, our culture, does not make people feel good about themselves. Our culture shows how good other people have it. And we must try to be that happy, to have that goodness. Our culture doesn't allow us to be happy with ourselves. So, Maury says, you, we, have to be strong and we have to know, if the culture doesn't work, then change the culture. Don't use it. Make your own culture. Don't worry about the pop culture, the popular culture, the television culture, the, the mass media culture. Don't worry about all that stuff. Yeah, it might be interesting, it might be entertaining, but don't let it affect you. You need to be strong and create your own culture. That's so important. In the living part of life, don't follow somebody else's culture. Make your own culture. It's not easy. You have to be strong. But make your own culture. And the most important thing when making your own culture is to surround yourself with loving nice people. There, yes, there are many bad people, but there are nice people. Find them. Surround yourself with them. Talk to them. Share with them. Enjoy them. So then Maury tells Mitch how he will die. So we have this happy moment, sad moment. Happiness, death. Happiness, death. Now we're going back to death. Maury tells Mitch that he'll die from suffocation. Meaning, when he dies, the reason he will die is because he won't be able to breathe. He says, four or five months. And then he does the breath test. And the breath test is, you breathe in, and then you breathe out and count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, four, fifty. How far can you go? 
And I think Mitch said he got to 70. And today, Maury did it. He got to 18. Last week, it was 23. So last week, all the way to 23. But this week, only to 18. Meaning his lungs are already losing their power. So he knows four, five months, he'll be dead. His lungs will give up. His tank will be empty like a gas tank. Very sad. So in this book, it goes up, down, up, down. Happy, sad, happy, sad. It's tough, it's tough. The next section, taking attendance. Now at this point, uh, Mitch left, went back home, working fifth gear, fifth gear. He goes to London, to Wimbledon, the tennis championship. Busy, 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 busy. But he keeps thinking about Maury. So he's busy with pop culture, sports and celebrities, da 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 And he thinks about Maury, who creates his own culture. And he realizes, God, my job is really stupid. This pop, following pop culture is not right. But it's a trap. But he realizes that modern culture is kind of a waste. There are too many distractions with modern culture. Television, sports, news. Is it really important to me? Many people spend all their time watching television, listening to the news, discussing celebrities, watching sports, talking about sports, talking about television, talking about songs, filling everything with noise and distractions, and nothing inside about feelings. Conversations, conversations about sports. And he realizes, wow, there really is this modern culture, this popular culture, that really is a waste of time. And he's a newspaper reporter. He's creating part of that distraction. News, gossip, celebrities, sports, dramas, distractions. So what is Maury's culture? What's, what's the old man's culture? What is his culture? Because most of our culture is news, gossip, celebrity, sports, drama. Maury's culture is discussion groups. Every week, he would meet with other professors, other students, and they would discuss issues, ethics, morals, discussion groups. Walks with friends. Taking a walk in the park with a friend. That was his culture. He would do that every day. Dancing to music. Once a week, he would go, and it didn't matter what music was playing. He didn't care about the music. He just let the music touch him so he could get some exercise and dream and imagine and enjoy. That was his culture. Charity. He gave to the community. He gave his time. He gave money. Reading. He read books for new ideas, to think about new things. Something he never thought of before was entertaining for him. He wrote letters with a pen. He wrote letters to friends, relatives, anyone. He enjoyed eating. He took his time when he had his meals. If lunchtime was an hour, he ate for an hour, slowly, enjoyed it, enjoyed the taste. He enjoyed nature. He would watch the trees, see how they changed. He would watch the wind, the breeze, the clouds, the grass, the flowers, the animals. He enjoyed nature. He was present 
in nature. So what is Maury's culture? Maury's culture was conversation, interaction, affection, love. What was Mitch's culture? Mitch's culture was work. 24-7. And work was about... Where's my list here? News, gossip, celebrity, sports, drama. That was his work. Maury says, to get the meaning of life, to, to understand the meaning of life, what should you do? Devote yourself to others. Give yourself to others. Help others. Devote yourself to community. Help the community around you. Somehow, do something. Pick up the trash. Do something. Help the community. Devote yourself to creating something that gives you purpose and meaning. Everybody, many people ask, what is my purpose in life? What is my meaning in life? Stop asking and create it. Create your purpose. Create your meaning. You'll find it. Stop asking and start doing something. What was Mitch's meaning in life? Mitch's meaning in life was seeing his words, his stories, seeing them in print, seeing them in the newspaper. Oh, and I lost my space. In other words, work. Mitch's meaning in life was work. Getting it done. Accomplishments. And then one day, Mitch's newspaper had a strike and Mitch basically lost his job. He was okay financially, but he lost his job. His job was writing newspaper articles every day in the newspaper, there's my name, there's my story, that's the meaning of life, and one day, boom, his job's gone. He's empty. There's no meaning in life. So, he was shocked because his, his meaning in life was work, and now he doesn't have work, but he realizes life that he knows still goes on. Gossip, celebrity, sports, games, drama. It continues. And he's sitting here not able to do anything, but life continues. Just like when Maury found out he was going to die, life continues. Right now, Mitch, the same thing. He lost his job. Oh, he lost his job. Life continues. So what, what does he do? He doesn't know what to do. So what he does is he goes back to Maury. And this is the last section I'm going to talk about. They call it First Tuesday, the First Tuesday. Mitch arrives at Maury's house and he sees that Maury reads the newspaper every day. He reads the newspaper and he's like, you know, why read the newspaper? Your, your life, your culture is, is beyond superficial news. Why read the newspaper? And Maury said, he reads the newspaper because he feels almost attracted to people who experience tragedy. And he, he's able to feel empathy great sadness for people who are experiencing tragedy. Specifically in this story, he talks about Bosnia. This is, you know, back in the 1990s when Bosnia had a terrible situation, Bosnia-Herzegovina. He doesn't know anybody in Bosnia, but he would actually cry. Actual tears would come when he read about the people and the suffering. His ability for empathy was huge. And Mitch realized, I write about 
dead people all the time, and I never shed a tear. And I'm sure all of us watch the news, read the news, but there's no emotion when we hear that somebody died. Sometimes, that's good. We, we should have emotion. But, but Maury, that's why he read the newspaper, so he could feel the loss of somebody else, so he could build that connection. I don't know. Mitch is very surprised that Maury cries. Maury is very uh, comfortable with his feelings. And Mitch never cries. He's a man. And Maury notices that. And Maury says, Ha ha, I will open you up. I will open up your heart again so that you can learn to feel again. Like when you were in college. The first time you came to college, you were not open. But I opened you up. And again, now that you're older, before I die, I will open you up again so that you can feel, so that you can enjoy your emotions. Let your emotions go. You'll enjoy life. You'll be happy. The most important thing in life, according to Maury, learn how to give out love. And let it come in. Let it come in. Now most people understand, yeah, for happiness we have to give love. We have to share love. And don't expect anything in return. Just give. Be a giving person. You'll be happy. And Maury says, no. Give love. Give love. And when love comes back, Accept it. Accept it like that hug. Remember the hug? Remember when you hug somebody, it's like, arr, arr, arr. but sometimes you can imagine when you really hug somebody and you just melt and the wall disappears. Maury says, that's the most important thing in life. Yeah, give, give love, give love. Let it come in. Allow love to come in. That is the most important thing. And the final part in this section was when they're talking about silence. Silence. How long can you endure silence? Can you enjoy silence? Do you enjoy silence? Or after a minute, do you need to turn on the radio, turn on the TV, listen to an MP3, listen to an audiobook, watch my videos? Do you need some noise? Talk to somebody, call somebody, text somebody. Do you need to open the newspaper? Do you need to do you open a book? Do you need to start cooking? Do you need to do something? Or, or can you just sit? and enjoy silence. Can you? For how long? Most people, truly, most people have a difficult time with silence. So I leave you, and I leave the book at this point, thinking about silence, thinking about hugging somebody, thinking about being present. It's a great book. I'm, I love the book. It's a fantastic book. Um, and we'll have at least, at least one more, probably two more videos talking about the rest of the book. And I'll make those in a couple of days. So, once again, this was from the first, from the very beginning to one hour and five minutes, roughly. Listen to it again. If you have the book in print, read through once again hold on a second read through the first tuesday through the first tuesday that was this section i hope that you enjoyed it this is a long video you probably fell asleep i apologize uh tell me 
do you like this? Uh, do you like the class? Is it helpful? Is it enjoyable? Does it help you understand the book? I hope so. That's it. I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye.